So I will read you two letters uh, now and one later. The first was to her friend Robert Zeidel from Berlin, and it was written in uh, 1898, dated June 23, 1898, and she was just 27 at the time. Dear friend, what a misery this is. I feel the need to chat with you, and now I don't even have a small piece of letter paper. You'll have to be satisfied with this. It's late in the evening. I'm sitting in a rocking chair at my desk, on which stands a lamp with a large red lampshade that I made myself. And I'm reading Berna. In front of me, the door to the balcony is open, and a fresh breeze is blowing in. There's a glaring flash of lightning from time to time as a storm is brewing. God help me, God forgive me for this prose poem of wretched quality. But that's certainly the way things are at times when there's loneliness. Just think, in this huge city of Berlin with two and a half million people, not a single friend. At this moment, I'm so content with this thought that I even have a complacent smile on my face. I don't know if the problem is that I'm made of such poor stuff that I absorb too readily from the surrounding atmosphere, but I cannot remain one day in the crush of humanity without my own spiritual level declining at least one notch. But of course, that's only for the moment. One day of solitude is all I need to find myself again. But in that process, I always have a bitter feeling of remorse, as though I'd lost a little part of myself, or as though I'd been demeaned. I always have the desire at such moments to shut myself off completely from the outside world, to board myself up. Do you know what gives me no peace nowadays? I'm dissatisfied with the form and manner in which people in the party, for the most part, write their articles. It's all so conventional, so wooden, so stereotyped. Nowadays, the words of a burner sound as though they're coming from another world. I know, of course, that the world is different now and different times want to hear different songs, but it is precisely these current songs from our tribe of scribblers, which for the most part are no songs at all, but just a droning without color or tone like the sound of a cogwheel spinning in a machine. I believe that the source of this lies in the fact that people, when they're writing, forget for the most part to go deeper inside themselves and experience the full import and truth of what they're writing. I believe that people need to live in the subject matter fully and really experience it every time, every day, with every article they write. And then words will be found that are fresh, that come from the heart and go to the heart, instead of the old familiar phrases. But people are so used to one or another truth or verity that they prattle or spout about the deepest and greatest subjects, as though they were mumbling a paternoster. I hereby vow never to forget when I'm writing to be inspired again on each occasion about what I'm writing and to go inside myself for that. And, um, the second letter was written nearly 20 years later, 
was to her friend Matilda Worm, uh, and it is from prison, dated February 16th, 1917. My dear Tilda, letter, postcard, and cookies received. Many thanks. Be at peace, despite the fact that you so boldly parried my thrust and are even challenging me to a duel, I remain as kindly disposed towards you as ever. I had to laugh that you want to engage in combat with me. Girl, I sit firmly in the saddle. No one yet has stretched me out on the sand. I'd be interested to see the one who can do it. It was for a different reason, though, that I had to smile, because you really don't want to engage in combat with me at all. And you even depend on me politically more than you want to believe is true. I will always remain a compass for you, because your very nature tells you that I have the most unerring judgment. In my case, all the distracting side issues fall away. Anxiety or nervousness, routinism, parliamentary cretinism, things that color the judgment of others. You argue against my slogan, here I stand, I can do no other your argument comes down to the following. That's all well and good, but human beings are too cowardly and weak for such heroism. Ergo, one must adapt one's tactics to their weakness and to the principle que va piano va sano. What narrowness of historical outlook, my little lamb. There's nothing more changeable than human psychology. That's especially because the psyche of the masses, like Thalassa, the eternal sea, always bears within it every latent possibility. Deathly stillness and raging storm, the basest cowardice and the wildest heroism the masses are always what they must be according to the circumstances of the times. And they're always on the verge of becoming something totally different from what they seem to be. It would be a fine sea captain who would steer a course based only on the momentary appearance of the ocean's surface and not understand how to draw conclusions from the signs in the sky or in the ocean's depths. My dear girl, disappointment with the masses is always the most reprehensible quality to be found in a political leader. A leader with the quality of greatness applies tactics not according to the momentary mood of the masses, but according to higher laws of development and sticks firmly to those tactics despite all disappointments and for the rest calmly allows history to bring its work to fruition. To me, it's disastrous that you now have no time or mood for anything but item number one namely the miserable state of the party, because such one-sidedness also clouds one's political judgment. And above all, one must at all times live as a complete human being. But look here, girl, if the fact is that you seldom get around to picking up a book, then at least read only the good ones not such kitsch as the Spinoza novel which you sent me. What do you want with this theme of the special suffering of the Jews? I am just as much concerned with the poor victims on the rubber plantations of Putumayo, the blacks in Africa, 
with whose corpses the Europeans play catch. You know the words that were written about the great work of the general staff, about General Trotta's campaign in the Kalahari Desert, and the death rattles of the dying, the demented cries of those driven mad by thirst, faded away in the sublime stillness of eternity. Oh, that sublime stillness of eternity in which so many cries of anguish have faded away unheard. They resound within me so strongly that I have no special place in my heart for the ghetto. I feel at home in the entire world, wherever there are clouds and birds and human tears. Yesterday evening, there were amazingly beautiful pink clouds above the walls of my fortress. I stood in front of my grated window and recited to myself my favorite poem by Muraka. Into a friendly city I came one day. Along its streets the ruddy glow of sunset lay. From an open window just then across a most luxuriant spread of flowers. Far off, I heard the golden trembling of bells, and a single human voice had the sound of a nightingale chorus, so that all the flowers quivered, so that all fragrances became more vivid, so that a higher redness touched the rose. Long was I held there, dazed with delight, astonished. How I came out of the city gates, to tell the truth, I do not know myself. And here, how lightly lies the world around me. The heavens heave with crowds decked out in purple, the cities in a golden haze behind me. How the stream roars amidst its alder bushes. How the ground groans with the grinding millstones. Like one who's drunk too much, I'm at a loss. O oh, muse, you've moved my heart to tears with your silken fetters of love. And so may life treat you well, my fine young girl. Heaven knows when I'll have a chance to write you again. Nowadays, I have no inclination for writing, but I owed you this one. I send you a kiss and a hearty squeeze of the hand. Your R. Thank you. I'm very pleased now to hand back over to Deborah Eisenberg to close the evening with another reading from the letters. Thank you, Deborah. So uh, this was a letter to Rosa's dear friend, Louise Kautsky, who was the wife of Karl Kautsky. It was written in a couple of months after the previous one I read, uh, also from prison, and it is uh, dated April 15th, 1917. Beloved Lulu, your short letter before Easter, because of its extremely depressed tone, troubled me deeply, and I've immediately taken it upon myself to drill some sense into your head once again. Tell me, how can you possibly keep singing your little song of woe like some unhappy cicada when such a bright chorus of lark song is ringing out from Russia? Don't you realize it's our own cause that is winning out triumphantly there? that world history in person is fighting her battles there and dancing the Carmagnol 
drunk with joy. When our common cause is going forward so well, must not all our private miseries be forgotten? I know it saddens you that I'm not free right now to gather up the sparks that are flying about over there to help and to provide direction there and elsewhere. Certainly that would be a fine thing. And you can imagine how every part of me is itching to do that. And every bit of news from there hits me like an electric shock that I feel all the way to my fingertips. But my not being able to take part doesn't get me down, not one bit. Nor does it occur to me to diminish my own joy over these events by moaning and groaning about something I cannot change. You see, I've just learned from the history of the past few years, and looking farther back from history as a whole, that one should not overestimate the impact or effect that one individual can have. Fundamentally, the powerful, unseen, plutonic forces in the depths are at work, and they are decisive. And in the end, everything straightens itself out, so to speak, of its own accord. Don't get me wrong, I'm not pronouncing my word in favor of a cheap, fatalistic optimism which only seeks to veil its impotence, the kind of outlook that, precisely in the case of your esteemed spouse, is so hateful to me. No, no, I'm ready at my post at all times, and at the first opportunity, will begin striking the keys of world history's piano with all 10 fingers so that it'll really boom. But since right now I happen to be on leave from world history, not through any fault of my own, but because of external compulsion, I just laughed myself and rejoiced that things are moving ahead without me. And I believe with rock hard certainty that all will go well. History always knows how to manage for the best, even when it seems to have run into a blind alley of the most hopeless kind. Dearest, when one has the bad habit of looking for a drop of poison in any blossom, one finds good reason as long as one lives to be moaning and groaning. If you take the opposite approach and look for the honey in every blossom, then you'll always find reason to be cheerful. Besides, Believe me, the time that I, and others as well, spend behind bars under lock and key will not be in vain. In the great overall settling of accounts, this too will somehow prove to be of value. I am of the opinion that one should without trying to be too crafty or racking one's brains too much, simply live the way one feels is right and not always expect to be repaid immediately with cash in hand. Everything will come out right in the end. And if not, to me it's all the same. I say, oh well, either way, I'm enjoying life so much Every morning, I thoroughly inspect the condition of the buds on all my bushes. And every day, I visit a little red ladybug with two black spots on its back, which, in spite of the wind and the cold, I've been keeping alive for a week on a little bough, warmly surrounded by cotton wool. And I observe the clouds, how they are constantly being renewed and becoming ever more beautiful. And on the whole, I feel that I am no, no more important than the ladybug. And I'm inexpressibly happy with this sense of my insignificance. Above all, the clouds. What an inexhaustible source of enchantment 
for a pair of human eyes. Yesterday, Saturday, around five in the afternoon, I stood leaning against the wire fence that separates my little garden from the rest of the prison yard. I let the sun shine on my back and looked east. There, a large cloud formation was piling up against the pale blue background of the sky. Its color was of the most tender gray, and above it there was a light glimmering of pink, as if some force from behind had breathed it out. It cast a spell as though it were an entire distant world in which endless peace and quiet, gentleness and refinement reigned. All in all, it seemed like a gentle smile, like a vague, beautiful memory from early childhood, or when sometimes one awakens in the morning with the cozy feeling of having dreamed something very beautiful without being able to remember exactly what. The prison yard was empty, and as always, I was alone, a stranger to everything around me. From the open windows of the prison came the thumping and knocking sounds of Saturday's scrubbing and scouring, and now and then a loud, reprimanding voice could be heard. Meanwhile, the chaffinch, way up high in the poplar tree, kept repeating its bird call over and over, and the trunk of the poplar tree, which is still quite bare and leafless, gave off a silvery gleam in the slanted rays of the departing sun. Everything breathed of such peace, and my gaze was fixed on the softly smiling cloud formation far off there in the sky. I stood there as though enchanted, and I thought to myself and to all of you, do you not see how beautiful the world is? Do you not have eyes as I do, and a heart like I do to rejoice in it all? Today I began the book Wallenstein by Ricarda Huch, and am deeply thankful to you for the book. It refreshes me tremendously with its lively activity of thought, as well as the enjoyment felt in depicting human fates, a joy that speaks so distinctly from every line of the book. Of course, it's not a work of exact science. Her conception of history has no serious basis at all, is thoroughly dilettantish, and for the most part is actually distorted. But for me, it's not the person or the book that forms my opinion, but the fundamental material out of which the book and the person are made. Opinions that are quite wrong don't bother me at all as long as I find an inner integrity, a lively intelligence, and the joy of an artist in painting a picture of the world and of life. How lovely it is that one constantly finds just around the corner new people in whom one can delight. That you are getting along so well now with Matilda Jacob is a great relief to me. In this case, once again, you experience something that I firmly believe in. One can only understand people correctly when one feels love for them. And now, be cheerful for me, do you hear? Don't grumble about the gray weather, but instead study how beautiful and many splendored this very gray sky is and don't have such impatient haste about the coming of spring, because as usual, it all goes by so quickly. Now, a person can at least enjoy the anticipation. <laughs>